Well, those in the classroom are back and ready to learn. We hope those of you by DVD are in the same situation and that you have your Bibles before you and that you'll open to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This is session 39 of our series on spiritual gifts and this session will deal with orderly worship. In our last session, we focused on prophecy and tongues in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 25, where Paul makes three main points. First, prophecy is more valuable to the church than tongues. Second, understanding what is being said is the most important thing. And third, prophecy is for believers, tongues is meant for unbelievers. In this session, Paul begins a new thought where he talks to the Corinthian church about the proper way to conduct their worship services. Their services were chaotic, their services were confusing, and Paul was attempting to bring order out of chaos and ensuring that God would be honored during these worship services. Have you ever gone to the circus? Some of you probably have. Some of you probably haven't had a chance to go. If not, I encourage you to go. It's an experience. You walk into this big tent. There are some seats on bleachers where you sit down, and then you spend an hour, two, three hours being entertained. However, there's three rings of activities going on over here. You'll have the lion tamers, and you'll have those who go in the cage with the bears and they tame the wild animals. And in the middle, you have the people on the flying trapeze who are swinging back and forth, doing daredevil stunts that could cause them life and limb. And then over here, you have the clowns and the jugglers. The jugglers juggling, doing amazing things. The clowns making the children laugh. And you sit there and you go, well, what should I look at? There's too much going on. I mean, I, that, whoa, that's interesting. Whoa, look at that. That's what Paul was saying it was like in the Corinthians church. There was too much going on. It was like a three ring circus. People were coming into the big tent, the church. They were sitting in their seats. And here were the prophets and they were giving the message of God. And here were the people speaking in tongues and trying to listen. And over here were the musicians who were playing hymns. And Paul said, there has to be some order to this worship service. And so he provides some instruction to them so that they will know exactly what it is that they should be doing. Please go down to verse 26. And we will be focusing on verses 26 through 40. Following his previous thought that tongues are not for believers, that prophecy is, and that people who hear us speaking in tongues in church who aren't believers or visitors, they'll think we're crazy. And those who come and hear prophecy may very well come to accept Christ. He goes on and says, What then shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. Now, the first thing to understand is that Paul is not prescribing a certain format for our worship services. Probably everyone watching the DVD everyone in the classroom, we all have different ways that our churches conduct their worship services. Paul has been in the Corinthian church for 18 months. He knows the Corinthian church. He's been to their worship services. When he was there, they were not chaotic. When he left, the fact that he was gone allowed the opportunity for people to do things their own way and things fell apart. And so Paul, knowing about the Corinthian church, having experienced it himself, is now laying out some ground rules for that church. It doesn't mean this is how our church should be run. 
What it does mean is there's certain basic principles underlying his uh, suggestions, his orders to the church that we should follow as well. It doesn't mean that you should come to the church and you should have some word of instruction you're going to say. It doesn't mean that you should allow a prophet to stand up and give a revelation or someone should speak in tongues and someone should interpret. Your church, you may have your worship service as you choose to have it. The basic principle is make sure that it's orderly, that it is not confusing, that there's an order to it. That is the overarching principle along with the second one in this verse. All of these things must be done for the strengthening of the church. So when you come together, however you conduct your worship services, the primary goal is that it strengthens the church. It strengthens everybody's walk with Christ who is attending that church service. That is the most important thing. The second thing is, and in order to accomplish that, make sure that it's done in an orderly way. So now he goes on and he gives some suggestions to this church about how they should conduct their worship service. He says, if anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak, one at a time, and somewhat should interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. Again, this is not necessarily how we should do it in our church, but in the Corinthian church, they did speak in tongues. Too many speak, were speaking in tongues. They spoke in tongues and there was no interpreter. So to bring order out of chaos, to make sure that people were strengthened in the church, he says, all right, two people, no more than three speak in tongues. That's the rule for you. Two, no more than three. And speak one at a time. Don't talk over each other like they were doing. And make sure someone's there to interpret. You can see how he is trying to lay out some ground rules that will give dignity to the worship service and not allow it to continue as a three-ring circus. So these are the rules that he sets down for the church. And he tells them that if you speak in tongues and if there is no interpreter, then the speaker should stop speaking, should not continue. And that speaker just sits down and whatever the message they felt that they had, they just speak in tongues to God in their private worship, in prayer. But they don't continue publicly with the entire church. So then he goes on, he says, all right, now you got two, three people speak in tongues. Now, two or three prophets should speak and others should weigh carefully what is said. He's trying to give some order. All right, speak in tongues, no more than three. Allow the prophets to speak, no more than three. And don't just accept their word for it. Weigh what they say. Evaluate it. Consider it. Decide for yourself, is what they're saying really of God? Don't just accept at face value that what a prophet is saying is true. It is up to you to decide if what they're saying is true and you will know by your spirit. In verse 30, and if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. So now you've got the two or three prophets who are speaking and they're speaking one at a time as in tongues. Now somebody suddenly senses a message from the Lord. They stand up. The other person who had the floor, who was speaking, should sit down. The principle here is that a message from God overrules everything else. If you are a church that allows prophecy to be given during the church service, then if someone senses that at that very moment God is giving them a message, then everyone else should yield way and listen to what the prophet is saying. I also want to remind you that prophets have to be 100% correct. That if they're less than 100% correct, they may in fact be removed from the church and suffer uh, spiritual death and relational death as a result. So weigh what they say, 
Be sensitive to the fact that God might move right at that moment and say something to someone. That person should stand, the other should yield, and listen to what God has to say. In verse 31, For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. Again, coming back to this, what's the whole point of going to worship? From our point of view, it's that we seek to be instructed. We want to be encouraged. From God's point of view, we come to church to glorify Him, to worship Him, to thank Him, to honor Him, to tell Him how grateful we are for the things that He's done for us. And in return, we hear the Word of God spoken, we're instructed, and we're encouraged. In verse 32, the spirits of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. This is a very uh, kind of nice way of saying, you guys work it out among yourselves. You know, you're prophets, you can kind of work out who goes first and who goes second. You're responsible for working it out. I don't have to go into all of the details. I'm trusting you that as long as you know, no more than three people in tongues, no more than three prophets, somebody has an instant message from God, let them speak. Kind of uh, in today's jargon, an I am, an instant message from God, like on the computer, let them speak. But you guys work it out yourself. You figure out all the details. I'm just giving you the basic idea. And then he, the most important principle he says, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. That is a great memory verse for those of you who seek to do some memorization and meditation. God's character is one of order. God is never confused. God never brings confusion to you. God always brings peace to you. He always brings harmony and unity to the church. We strive to serve the contemporary Christian community with a variety of Christian educational and evangelistic resources. To see TVS Seminary's database, please visit tvsseminary.com. Sometimes when I don't understand exactly what's being said in a passage, I turn to the paraphrases, the people who have taken the Bible and they're not trying to write literally what the Greek says and what the Hebrew says. Instead, they try to write it in everyday language that we could understand. They try to be true to what the message is, but they try to say it in a way where the words don't line up exactly what, what was said in the original manuscripts. One of the versions that I like the best is called the message. And for this verse about God is not a God of disorder but of peace, in the message it's written, God doesn't stir up confusion but harmony. That helps me understand it, that God doesn't want to stir up confusion. He's a God that likes order. After all, the sun, the moon, the stars, all of the planets, they all have a certain order to it, a certain rhythm. The body is a body of order. It's not confusing in how it operates. And he's saying the church should be the same type of organism. Well, then he goes on to a very sensitive subject. First, he's talked about, here's the proper order you should follow. Now he goes on to, what's the role of women in the church? And we have discussed that previously in another session, so we're not going to go in-depth here, but we are going to touch on it because it's here in Scripture. There are two views of the, what we're going to talk about. One is, these are the rules for all time, all place, everywhere. When Paul said it, that's the word, follow it, and no arguments because it's from God. The second view is that, no, Paul is talking to the Corinthian church. He understands the problems in the Corinthian church, that some of the women may very well have been too outspoken. They might have been the ones who were dominating tongues and dominating prophecy. As we've mentioned before, go to most churches, 
you'll find primarily women at the church, not men. And making no judgments about women, women do, in general, like to talk more than men like to talk. And I think there are some who say, this was a problem in that church. So Paul was telling the women of that church, no more. And then there are, is a third group that looks at this passage and says, Paul was relating it to the culture of his time, where women had a far different role than they have in many societies today. They were servants. They were subservient to the man. They had to do what their husband said, and the husband was in charge of the home. And if the husband said, I want a divorce, that was it. They were gone. They had no rights legally. They were just simply attached to their husband. Part of the reason in those times was because a, a woman looked to have a man who would protect her. It was a very dangerous era with a lot of robbers, criminals, people who would come and uh, take advantage of women. And so there was this idea that the man had to protect the woman and therefore out of uh, uh, gratefulness she should do what the man said. Now that's very different in my society, in my world, probably in many of your worlds, but not necessarily everybody watching by DVD. So these people say, this only had to do with that culture. You have to make the Bible culturally relevant. So we have three views. One that says, Paul said it, I believe it, that's enough for me. That's how it should be. Some people have said, no, 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 no. He's talking here to the Corinthian church. He's not even thinking that other people are going to be reading this. He didn't know this was going to end up as the Bible. He's just writing them a letter. And so it's about Corinthians. And other people say, yeah, but it's really just about the culture of the times. And the times have changed, cultures have changed, therefore we should change. I make no judgments about what your church believes or what you personally believe. I have a responsibility to tell you what I believe, but you should weigh what I say carefully and decide if you believe it too. First, let's find out what Paul says. He says, beginning down in the second part of verse 33, as in all congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. No talking. They are not allowed to speak but must be in submission as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, if they want to ask a question, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Now those are pretty strong words, and there are some who say, Look at what he says at the beginning and at the end. In the beginning he says, as in all of the congregations. So the argument about this is just for the Corinthians. No, 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 no. Paul's saying it's true everywhere. And then you go to the end and it says, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak at church. They say, Paul had a pretty strong opinion about that. And so he's saying that's true everywhere. Now, my belief is that in our times, God has created man and woman equally. He created man and he created woman. All men can have all of the spiritual gifts. All the women can have all of the spiritual gifts. Some people believe women should only use their spiritual gifts with other women. And men are the only ones who can use it with both. I do not believe that. I believe that God has given all of us spiritual gifts to help all of us grow, to all of us mature. And I have been helped very greatly by a book that I am going to recommend that if this is an interesting topic to you, that you may want to pick up and read. But I warn you in advance, this is not a book that is easy to read. This is a theological book. This is where the author goes in to different places and is arguing for sexual equality in the church. That this idea that women have to be subservient to men in the church 
is no longer relevant. Beyond sex roles, what the Bible says about a woman's place in the church and family by Dr. Gilbert Belzikian, it is a book that I highly recommend. Dr. Belzikian is someone I know. He attends our church. In fact, all of my church comes from the viewpoint of Dr. B, as we call him in our church. He is a beloved person in our church. He is a uh, retired college professor. He taught at Wheaton College for 20 years, and he has written a number of scholarly books about different issues in the church. And his argument is, when you go back to the very beginning, God created man and woman. We are different. Anyone who denies that men and women are, the same, uh, are uh, not the same is crazy. We're different. We see things differently, we're physically differently, almost everything about us is different. But what Dr. Belzikian says is that we are equal before God. That the very fact that woman was made from the rib of man meant that they are side by side equal. That one of them was created first and has been given the responsibility for leadership in the home. But that responsibility must be loving leadership and not dictatorial leadership. And that's a challenge for all husbands, but frankly, it's a challenge for all wives to learn when there were times to submit to your husband and when there are times that you do not. Every husband and wife must work this issue out among themselves if you're believers in Christ. My wife and I, when we first got married, we decided that we would discuss an issue together. We would try to reach agreement on that issue. We would not make a decision until we were in agreement unless a decision had to be made. If we ran out of time and you had to make a decision, then the rule was, I'm responsible for the decision. Someday I will have to answer to God, so I, in love, will make the decision and my wife's role was to go along with the decision and not to say to me, I told you so, if it went wrong. Which is the hardest thing to do. You work it out the way that you want to work it out, but I'll tell you that was a blessing to us. It saved a lot of arguments. It saved a lot of heartache. It made us co-equal. It made us true partners in the faith. But there are times where a decision has to be made and our view was that God gave man the responsibility to be the leader in the home in a loving way, co-equal with his wife. So I recommend this book highly and I ask once again as I have in all of these issues that tend to divide the church, two points. One, let us agree to disagree. It's okay that we don't agree. Let's just not fight about it. Let's have unity in the church and let's celebrate the fact that there is diversity in, of belief in the church. The one thing I'll bring up again is that I believe someday we'll stand before God and He'll say, why did you argue over so many dumb things? The main point was that people come to me and accept me as Christ. Let us not major on the minors. Let's major on things that are major. And Paul goes on then in verse 36, going down to the end, he says, Did the word of God originate with you, or are you the only people it has reached? If anybody thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am saying is, I am writing to you, is the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Paul is exerting his authority as an apostle. The people who believe this is the way it should be in churches point to these passages where clearly Paul says, I'm writing at the Lord's command. My question is, was the Lord's command for all time or was it meant for this church in this period of time? That's where the disagreement lies. And I would say I've been blessed by the contributions that women have made in my life uh, as I've grown in Christ and in the lives of our churches. 
Why should they not bless all congregations? But please, you choose. So in the end, he says, Therefore, my brothers, be eager to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. So as he's writing to the Corinthians, he's saying, be eager that there are people who prophesy in your church and you will benefit from what they share with you. But he also says, do not forbid the speaking in tongues. Again, the question, is that a command for all churches or is that a command that's only for this church? In my church, which is the only example I can share with you, our church elders recognize there is a spiritual gift of tongues and of interpretation. However, there is are 30,000 people in our church and it is a very uh, divisive issue in the church. People get angry about this back and forth. So they have said, for the sake of harmony, we ask that those of you who speak in tongues not practice it in the worship service. You practice it in your private worship or you practice it in your small group where that is encouraged. And it, for 35 years now, we have not had a major conflict in our church, a major scandal. And I believe it's because we have focused on the principle of harmony and unity. And though some people have certain beliefs and they think that those gifts are right, they have, out of humility and respect for the elders, given up their right to use their gift at church for the sake of unity. I would ask that your church decides how you will handle this issue yourself. So in conclusion, Paul says, Be eager that there are prophets, but don't forbid speaking in tongues. But the overarching principle is, Everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Thank you for joining us for this session. And please come back for the next one where we'll move to a different topic. We're going to talk about how certain gifts are very similar to each other. And we're going to try to make some distinguishing characteristics between them so that we understand and have clarity to what they mean. We'll see you then.